Captain Willie Daniels II, Shades of Blue founder and STEM pioneer, is a pilot for United Airlines in the District of Columbia metro area at Washington Dulles Airport. Captain Daniels established Shades of Blue in 1999 overseas, overall operations of the organization, coordinating with school districts across the country. He recruits pilots, engineers, and scientists to classrooms as role models while mentoring and tracking students through college. The mission of Shades of Blue is creating educational opportunities, training, and employment assistance that is needed for youth to pursue careers in aviation, aerospace, and STEM industries. Welcome back to the uh, final uh, episode of Shades of Blue honoring America's heroes. And, and we know we have folks uh, around the, the world uh, from going from, say, the Canary Islands to the United States, all the way across the United States, all the way out to uh, Hawaii that are, are coming in on our webcast. And, and we're, we're going to um, just keep our introduction brief on this because we have some very, very special guests for you here in the next hour. And uh, for those of you who would like to ask questions, uh, do not forget, you can do that by uh, going to www.shadesofbluewebcast at gmail.com. And uh, we're, we're going to start right away with our, our next guest. He is the, uh, one of the Western Regional uh, Presidents for TAI. TAI stands for the uh, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporation. And we're going to start right away because we have some exciting uh, guests to wrap up our series, Honoring America's Heroes. We want you to all understand the significance of what this has done over the last uh, three days here to be able to provide you those opportunities and that you may want to pursue careers in the fields of aviation and aerospace and the STEM and STEAM related fields. Brig General USAF RET Leon Johnson retired from the U.S. Air Force after 33 years of service. During his Air Force career, General Johnson was the Vice Commander of the 10th Air Force at the Joint Reserve Base in Fort Worth, Texas, served as Mobilization Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force and Director Operations at the Air Education and Training Command. A command pilot with over 3,500 hours of military flying time in the T-37 trainer, A-37, and A-10 fighter aircraft included missions over Bosnia in support of Operation Deny Flight. General Johnson also commanded a fighter squadron and a fighter group. Following the events of 9-11, the General Johnson served as a director of the Air Force Crisis Action Team at the Pentagon. He is currently the National President of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporate and Board Chair for the Tuskegee Airmen Foundation. Yes, this is uh, Willie, Captain Willie Daniels, president and founder of Shades of Blue, honoring America's heroes. And we're, we're back here with uh, uh, Mr. Marv Abrams, the uh, Western Regional, or Western Regional, Central, Central Regional President yes. of the Tuskegee Airmen Corporation, the Tuskegee Airmen. Marv, I want to thank you for right. coming in as Glad one of our here. subject matter experts and right. being here. To, to be able to show these young people around the world uh, this, the huge significance that have taken place, not only with the Tuskegee Airmen, mm -hmm. and, and, but the importance it is for them to understand history. Because I learned a long time ago, if you don't understand history, how can you know where you're going to go in the future? Very so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this opportunity to let you uh, uh, speak to our audience and, and okay. tell them a little bit about you and, and the Tuskegee Airmen. All right, all right. I'm a, a native of uh, Detroit, Michigan, which is where the Tuskegee Airmen organization originally started back in 1972. So I had a uh, early ex exposure to the history of the airmen and their, their, their uh, contributions to aviation and to science and technology overall and just to the uh, citizenship within the United States. So got my interest started, went from there into the uh, United States Air Force. I did uh, about 26 years in the Air Force. Uh, various uh, career fields there, including medical, uh, working with the aviation side there, mm -hmm. and then went into education and training, and in the current uh, role as an instructional designer. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to, uh, to take those uh, 
the uh, pieces and parts that individuals have mm -hmm. of their of their career fields and to help them grow them into other individuals. So it's been a uh, an outstanding uh, opportunity for me and to continue using the uh, Tuskegee Airmen and help the Tuskegee Airmen grow their legacy mm -hmm. across the world. Well, well Marv, I, I understand, you know, and th with, with that being said, uh, what can you say uh, to a young student inspiring to, to say maybe follow in your footsteps, maybe going to the military, or, or maybe go if they're going to pursue a career in aviation or in the medical field? Mm -hmm. What would you say is most important for you that you could relate to them? Yeah, uh, easy. The, the most important thing, I think, Captain, is the fact of being prepared. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities out there. Uh, everything is not for everyone, and it's not always a, 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 um, an item of making your choice and sticking mm -hmm. to that one particular choice. But being prepared mm -hmm. is the most important thing, I mm -hmm. think, on taking the opportunities that are available, the educational opportunities, education such as your program mm -hmm. as well, that uh, give a, uh, an exposure to what's available. And once you find out what's available, then taking it from there and, and making a decision on what really mm -hmm. matters and what feels good to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Marv, I, I, I tell you, it, it is truly an honor to, to be here with you, and, and uh, could you, you share a little bit about the, you know, we had in our previous uh, session one of the original no. Tuskegee Airmen here for right. our audience to be able to, right. to have an opportunity to meet, and um, can you tell us a little bit about that and your involvement with okay. the... Uh, right. The organization itself, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, uh, our principles are to continue that legacy and the history of the original airmen. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, most people know the airmen either from way back, a, a movie, a, a cable movie on the mm -hmm. airmen, and then most recently the Red Tails movie that came out about four years ago. And that tells one uh, component of the, of, the, of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, from the from the war effort side of things and the fact that they were the first African-American aviators in the United States military. Mm -hmm. But I think you know as well that uh, for every pilot, there are those that are behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, so for every pilot there was within the Tuskegee Airmen, there were those support personnel. Uh, and the entire program itself uh, was able to generate an, an outstanding number of individuals in medicine, in, uh, in engineering, in finance. Uh, there, there are a multitude of contributions that the Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. made and that mm -hmm. just makes them that much more important mm -hmm. and that's why it's important to me to make mm -hmm. sure their story is told mm -hmm. because everyone can't be a pilot even though it's a great career field everyone can't be into uh, into just aviation itself but there's the science there's the technology piece and there's the support pieces of, of that part that give an opportunity for anybody whatever their interests are to be part of it and well, I think that's what makes it so important for the Tuskegee Airmen story. Well, well you, you mentioned one thing and, and that was the support team uh, yes. and, and like when you when you look at uh, one of our heroes that we're going to be honoring uh, this evening at our um, our uh, uh, function is Miss Katherine Johnson and Miss so. Katherine Johnson was one of those people kind of behind the scene and was recently uh, acknowledged by our, our president of the country yes. and that the fact that, that this lady is now 98 years old but <laughs> nobody knew it until just very recently that she was one of the uh, many behind the scene individuals african-american females and this is right. very important for all of you female mm -hmm. ma mathematicians sure. to help develop all of the algorithms to go to the moon right. and back exactly. for the apollo missions and that, that's what is really, really significant. And you mentioned it, and I think you hit the nail on the head with, with team effort and yes. everything. Yes. And it uh, looks like we have a question coming okay. in from our audience. Okay. Uh, what inspired you when you were younger? Ah, excellent question. Uh, what inspired me when I was younger? As I said, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. And Detroit, Michigan was the start of the Tuskegee program or the start of the organization we now know. So being and having that opportunity to meet some of those gentlemen at a young mm -hmm. age and, and hear some of their stories and see the impact that they had was a great inspiration for me to move forward because that told me that uh, the, the one lesson that they told more than anything else is if you are provided an opportunity and that opportunity, regardless of anything else, gives you a way to make your, your goals a reality. Mm -hmm. well, 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 Mr. Abrams, I, I know we have a, a really fun and exciting uh, uh, lineup here for Definitely. the close out of our, our session. So I, I want to thank you and oh, I, I look forward you. to working with the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporation. Same, same. Thank you for coming in and sharing 
uh, your your ideas and, and and some of your inspiration for the next generation. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, well, yeah. Really appreciate Great. that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Major General USMC RIT Charles Frank Bolden Jr. was nominated by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate as the 12th Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. At NASA, Bolden has overseen the safe transition from 30 years of space shuttle missions to a new era of exploration focused on full utilization of the International Space Station in space and aeronautics technology development. He has led the agency in developing a space launch system rocket and Orion spacecraft that will carry astronauts to deep space destinations, such as an asteroid and Mars. He also established a new space technology mission directorate to develop cutting edge technologies for the missions of tomorrow. We're now here with a very, very special guest. It's a, I think this is an ultimate treat for, for, <laughs> for us and, 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 and everything. And for me. <laughs> and and, and it, we were here with uh, Major General and Administrator uh, Charlie Bolden. Uh, I want to thank you and, and thank uh, NASA for the opportunity to be here and, and have an opportunity to broadcast. Uh, we, we had uh, schools across the nation, uh, as far as the Canary Islands, wow. all across the United States, going all the way out to the Hawaiian Islands uh, uh, by the thousands that have uh, joined us. Yeah. And, and, and I, I know your emphasis is on the importance of education and, and especially with, with science. But I'd like to get your input because sure. I, and maybe have you tell a little bit of your story about the origins of NASA yeah. and, and as the administrator of NASA, what are your visions for the future? Sure. Uh, NASA is, uh, I, I tell people, I have to remind people all the time, although we were only founded in 1958 technically, we're more than 100 years old because our, mm -hmm. our heritage is from the old NACA, the National uh, Aeronautics the National mm -hmm. Advisory Committee on Aeronautics that was established way back in 1915 when mm -hmm. the United States found themselves, after having been the home, the birthplace mm -hmm. of aviation, mm -hmm. we found ourselves following Europe and everybody else mm -hmm. because we couldn't figure out a, a thing to do with the Wright Brothers airplane. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the President and the Congress established mm -hmm. the NACA and from then on working with uh, what became an aviation industry, we built ourselves up to where we built the first supersonic mm -hmm. airplane. Uh, we were the, the beginnings of going into space. And then in 1958, once again, it took a shock mm -hmm. uh, to let mm -hmm. us know that we needed to think about how we, how we attacked uh, issues that were before us. And that was when Sputnik went over here in mm -hmm. 1957. Wow. And it, it frightened the world because up until that time, no one had actually employed a satellite mm -hmm. that could go around the world. And mm -hmm. so again, the Congress and the President, President Dwight Eisenhower in this case, decided that the United States needed an organization that would focus on space flight, on trying to get humans into space as well as satellites. Mm -hmm. And so NASA was born as, uh, under the National Space Act of 1958. Mm -hmm. um, we've come a long way. We've put people on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, we have continued to be a, a big player in, in aeronautics, uh, helping mm -hmm. industry to produce ever increasingly efficient airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now into the realm of unmanned aerial systems, trying to mm -hmm. help the FAA with smoothing out travel in the skies. Uh, our science, uh, bar none, is the best in the world, whether you're talking about air, um, astrophysics or planetary science, mm -hmm. looking at our own mm -hmm. planet as one, um, or whether you're just talking about heliophysics, looking at our sun. So, so NASA continues to go. We're on a journey to Mars right now. That's mm -hmm. the President Obama in 2010. Uh, challenged NASA in what I consider mm -hmm. to be a major space policy address mm -hmm. from the Kennedy Space Center. He challenged us to put humans um, on Mars in the 2030s uh, with the intent, we put them in Mars orbit first with mm -hmm. the intent of landing. And he even said, and I intend to be there when we mm -hmm. do it, you mm -hmm. know, so, which makes me believe we got to do it. So we've been, we've been after that since 2010 and we're well on the way to Mars now for, with humans. Oh, that, that, that's absolutely fantastic. And, and, and for, for our, uh, our, audience out there and especially the young student audience what are what are some of the biggest challenges that we're going to be facing yeah. because I know uh, going into space is not yeah. easy well with your previous uh, participant in the program you mentioned Katherine Johnson mm -hmm. uh, and I'm glad you did because Katherine Johnson is, as you said was there's a movie and a book about about her and several other African-American mm -hmm. women called Hidden Figures 
And the title of the book comes from the, the author lived in Langley, Virginia, where Catherine mm -hmm. and her, mm -hmm. her co cohorts worked. And her father, being a black engineer, was, mm -hmm. was working at Langley. So she said she never realized that people didn't think NASA didn't have <laughs> people of color. And so she decided to write a book on these incredible women because they went to her church. She saw mm -hmm. them all the time. Nothing's changed today for NASA. Mm -hmm. We need, the, what we need more than anything else if we're going to get to Mars is the support staff. Mm -hmm. um, we have astronauts, but, but they're so, their number is so small in comparison with the, the, the entire team of now 17,000 NASA mm -hmm. employees and about 40,000 mm -hmm. contractors that support us. Mm -hmm. And they do everything from administrative work through law, medicine, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, the astronauts happen to be test pilots mm -hmm. for the most part and engineers. So we need a whole suite of people. What Shades of Blue does in promoting mm -hmm. the STEM fields, science, mm -hmm. technology, engineering, and math, and you all have mm -hmm. adopted the same thing that, that my deputy, Dr. David <laughs> Newman, and I have, and adding the A in for the arts. For the arts. And, and now we've added a D on the end for design. Oh, I like because that. Because <laughs> we want young people to understand that no matter what their passion, mm -hmm. they can be a part of the NASA family. They can be a part of, mm -hmm. of building uh, this future and getting humans mm -hmm. to Mars. So mm -hmm. for any mm -hmm. student who's out there watching, no matter where you happen to be on the Distant Learning Network, um, I would say study really hard and, and really, really, really work as if you were playing a sport. You know, you wouldn't expect to be the best player on the football mm -hmm. team or the best player on the basketball team or the best dancer if you didn't mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. Have to do the same thing in the classroom. Yeah, and, and then the biggest mm -hmm. thing is mm -hmm. don't be afraid of failing. I could tell, mm -hmm. tell you the Willie Daniels story and we don't have time to do that, but, <laughs> but, but my friend Willie Daniels and I have known each other for a long time mm -hmm. and his alone is an absolutely incredible story of not being afraid to fail. Well, well, yesterday we were fortunate enough to uh, have uh, uh, retired astronaut and Colonel Fred Gregory on board and uh, to talk with the students and uh, and he retired from NASA yep. as the acting administrator back in uh, 2006 mm -hmm. and uh, he had an opportunity to talk about and with one, one of the uh, uh, Dr. Yvonne Cagle who was one of the uh, uh, other astronauts mm -hmm. here about the trip to Mars, and right now I understand about eight and a half months to get to Mars. Yeah, and, unfortunately. And, <laughs> and, and Colonel Gregory was saying, hey, you know, what we need to do is focus on um, the time it takes to get there, because if we can figure out a mm -hmm. way, and this is a challenge for mm -hmm. all of those young folks out there, figure out a way how do how do we shrink the time it takes mm -hmm. us to go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. If we can shrink that time and uh, possibly speeding up the spacecraft, yep. we can get there within a week and we can do all of this yep. development and yeah. technology that, that, that we have since then. So I, I think that should be a big challenge to the next generation that's coming down the pipe. Absolutely. And, and what, what do you, uh, you see as, as your, your, your final uh, plans while you're here at NASA. Well, I've got a long time to go. We're, we're as, as we like to say, I'm, I'm with the president. And so um, I am in this job until the president mm -hmm. leaves office. So we're all sprinting to the finish line to mm -hmm. get to January the 20th. We've got a lot to do at NASA. We've got um, some tests that are upcoming um, with our, actually with our Orion crew module. Mm -hmm. uh, what is really important for us right now is working with our partner SpaceX mm -hmm. and Boeing on uh, getting uh, complete mm -hmm. the two vehicles that are going to be able to carry our astronauts mm -hmm. to the International Space Station within a couple of years so that we're no longer dependent on the Russians. So, and in the area of science, we're still working steadily on the James Webb Space Telescope that wow. will go into its final big test down at the mm -hmm. Johnson Space Center um, middle of next year, where it'll go into a vacuum chamber for a number of months to simulate what it's going to be like when it gets out uh, a million and a half kilometers away from Earth, but mm -hmm. 2018, we're going to launch that, and, and it will dwarf all that we know about our universe from the Hubble Space Telescope. So wow. a lot of things we're doing, trying to wow. help build new airplanes with X-planes and, mm -hmm. and everything. Wow. Well, Mr. Spirit of it looks like we have a question coming in. Sure. We, we got a lot of eager audience <laughs> want to get some questions <laughs> in. So uh, the, the question is, if you could have, if you could have done it, Any, anything else, what would it have been? Nothing, I would not have done anything differently than I've done. I, and people ask me this question a lot. What, would you, what do you wish you could go back and change or what do you wish you could have done differently? I am incredibly happy with, with mm -hmm. my place in life right now. 
I have uh, the three most wonderful granddaughters that anyone could ask for. They're mm -hmm. 16, 13, and, and 10. They're the, they're the love of my life, mine and my mm -hmm. wife's. We have an un mm -hmm. unbelievable son who's a colonel in the Marine Corps wow. and, um, and a daughter who is a plastic mm -hmm. surgeon at Howard University Hospital that's really interested in trying to help women of color battle, um, you know, just the fear of cancer, but mm -hmm. also to let them know that should they fall victim to it, that's not mm -hmm. the end of the road and there's always things that can go. So I, I wouldn't touch anything that I've done in my life so far, to include the mistakes. <laughs> I just, because I, you know, I, when I talk about don't be afraid of failure, I, I really try to help students understand if, if you're trying to go through life without ever mm -hmm. failing, you're going to miss a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you should really follow your passion, take risks, but make mm -hmm. them smart risks. Mm -hmm. Because every time I have failed in my life, and I've done it a lot, mm -hmm. um, I have learned so much through failure that's made me even better the mm -hmm. next time around, or made me stronger as a, as a person. So mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't go back and change anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I understand that one of your big passions right now yeah. is education. Yep, I am. And, 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 and could, you, could you elaborate on yeah, that for me a little I, bit? <laughs> it's in my blood. I, I come, my wife and I both come from families of educators. We both grew up in the segregated South, in Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. My mother was a librarian at the elementary, middle school, and then high school level when they integrated the schools. Mm -hmm. And she became the first black librarian to go into a formerly white high school. My father was a teacher of civics and social studies and was my high school football coach. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, my, my in-laws were both principals at the elementary school level. So my wife and I were just, we didn't know anything except mm -hmm. how important education was. And wow. so I believe that in order for us to reach Mars, in order for us to do all the great things that NASA wants to do, we've got to have an educated populace and we have to have mm -hmm. um, a significant representation mm -hmm. from women and minorities. You know, mm -hmm. we, Otherwise, we're going to miss a lot of talent in our mm -hmm. country. So mm -hmm. um, my job, my, my purpose in life is to try to go all the way down into kindergarten mm -hmm. and help kids understand that while they may not think they like math and mm -hmm. science, pick something mm -hmm. they do like, whether it's mm -hmm. painting or dancing or whatever. Mm -hmm. We'll help them understand mm -hmm. where math mm -hmm. and science come into that. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's a ballerina mm -hmm. that's, that's twirling and puts her arms out and <laughs> brings them in when she wants to go faster. And, we help explain, you know, what you just saw was physics, and, mm -hmm. it, and it's and it's based on math. So, um, that that's what I'm passionate about. Well, well that, that's ab that's absolutely fantastic uh, vision because we're, right now we're we it's my uh, belief that we have millions of kids that are viewing this yeah. right now across mm -hmm. across our nation, and and this is a, such a significant opportunity for them to to realize and see that this is very very important. They, that they will be the next intellectual capital. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 you know when when President Kennedy uh, back in in 1961 said, I I want to send a man to the moon. He didn't just want to send them one way. He, him one way. He's going to bring them back yeah. again yeah. safely, and not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Exactly. And 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 that's the same thing with your the vision going to Mars. Uh, we don't want to just send them on a one-way trip. We, we want to send them there back. and bring them, <laughs> bring them back. Not because oh, yeah. it's easy, but because yeah, it's hard. Exactly. So we need the hard, dedicated work ethics in the kids to be the best that they can be, yeah. to be that. And, and it looks like we have another question coming in. What was your favorite oh, subject in school? That's easy. Um, I, I always liked math and science. Um, I was very fortunate that in seventh grade, I. I had two, two teachers, both men, uh, back, back then having men in a junior mm -hmm. high school class was mm -hmm. rare. Uh, teaching was left to the women, but, mm -hmm. but I had two strong men. My math teacher was a long name, King Benjamin Lindbergh Jeffcoat, who <laughs> later went on to become a principal and then the superintendent of education mm -hmm. in the state of South Carolina. Wow. Uh, and then Mr. James P. Neal, who, um, who was my science teacher. Mr. Mm -hmm. Neal got me introduced into science fairs. Um, mm -hmm. I did it in seventh grade and never looked back after that. I would not let a year go by that I didn't participate in a science mm -hmm. fair project. Uh, and then Mr. Jeffcoat introduced me and several other members of my class to what then was called new math. Students mm -hmm. today know it as set theory or mm -hmm. other kinds of things, Venn diagrams, so they know mm -hmm. all this stuff. But it is what, what people who are planners in big business today mm -hmm. use, and, and he taught us that when we were in eighth mm -hmm. grade. So mm -hmm. math and science have always been my favorite. Mm -hmm. well, well, being here, um, 
uh, working out of Goddard Space Flight Center and, and using uh, the technology from uh, Langley, mm -hmm. the digital learning network, you know, which you know, I, f I find very fascinating because this, I was really surprised to learn that a lot of our educators out there, a lot of our school systems mm -hmm. and school districts don't know that NASA has created such a vast wealth of information mm -hmm. And, and how they can take advantage of that opportunity mm -hmm. to help bring their kids up to the level where where you would consider them say, hey, I, I really like this individual to be a member of NASA. Yeah. Uh, and can you elaborate on that a little bit? I can, and I can tell you, you know, I don't know whether there's anybody on, on the net this time from Australia, but, but the Distance Learning Network gives us the, the capability of reaching out to almost anybody anywhere in the world that, that can get into a video teleconferencing system that's compatible with ours. We've actually in the past, after I went down to mm -hmm. Adelaide, Australia and visited a, um, a science center where they mm -hmm. actually had a Mars yard mm -hmm. and they, would, they were doing rovers and mm -hmm. robots and mm -hmm. stuff and we said, boy, that would be great if some of our kids in the U.S. could have mm -hmm. an opportunity to participate in that. Came back and talked to the folk in the Distance Learning Network and lo and behold, we were able to hook up with, with students in a museum mm -hmm. Uh, in a science museum mm -hmm. in Adelaide, Australia. And so this capability allows us to do that. I, I, we have actually used it from a, on occasion working cooperatively with an organization mm -hmm. that supports military children mm -hmm. overseas, an organization called the Military Child Education Coalition. Mm -hmm. And they have a, a system that's very similar to our distance learning network. We found out they were compatible and so we were able to interconnect with that. So we could give NASA content mm -hmm. to uh, military students, military kids mm -hmm. around the world to try mm -hmm. to help them know what, what students in the United States can get almost any time they want. Well, you know, I, I, I know that one of your most recent successes is, was the mission to uh, Jupiter yep. with, uh, with Juno and, and now we're seeing some yeah. unbelievable uh, photographs coming back from, from that. And then uh, the uh, previous success of uh, of um, the uh, New Horizons yep, and going to Pluto. Going to Pluto. Uh, yeah, could you, as the administrator, yeah. tell me a little bit about that and uh, how excited you were I, when you I saw I get kind of giddy when I talk about them. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're sitting here at, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, as you mentioned, and um, they had a huge part to play in both those missions. Um, because almost everything we do today is collaboration with industry and academia and mm -hmm. our foreign partners. Um, Goddard has the premier astrophysics uh, instrument in preparation mm -hmm. right now called the James Webb Space mm -hmm. Telescope that's going to allow us to look uh, in a couple of years at distant planets in other solar systems wow. and other galaxies. Wow. And it's not very far from here in test, mm -hmm. so it's fascinating. Um, I think it's missions like Juno, like New Horizons, mm -hmm. uh, like some of the ones that we, we just launched on the 8th of this month, uh, the 8th of September, a mission called OSIRIS-REx mm -hmm. that's actually traveling over the next year or so to a, an asteroid, a pretty big asteroid that's mm -hmm. going to pass by Earth a long way away from Earth, but, but will pass by anyway on its journey around the sun. And uh, it's called Bennu. Bennu. And OSIRIS-REx is going to go out, rendezvous with Bennu, and kind of search it out with cameras and sensors and everything, mm -hmm. decide where it wants to land. Wow. And then it's going to go down near the surface of the, of the astro asteroid, not quite land, but hover, has a big arm that's going to go down and wow. punch into the surface, rip, stick up dust and stuff, collect it, mm -hmm. put it into a canister, and then bring it back mm -hmm. to, the, to, to Earth. Mm -hmm. And in 2023, it's going to drop that canister from space mm -hmm. down into the desert, into the mm -hmm. Utah desert. And for the first time, we'll actually have samples Wow. Uh, from an asteroid that we can study to help us learn a little bit more about our solar system, but more mm -hmm. importantly, about our own Earth. You know, I, I'm wearing a, an extra pin up here. That I don't know how, pe how many people can see it. Mm -hmm. I have my NASA pin, which I always wear, but I'm wearing another one that's for AmeriCorps. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's an organization that, has, that houses things like Teach for America. Mm -hmm. um, we work collaboratively with them in our effort to get information mm -hmm. into classrooms. Uh, Teach for America is an incredible program that takes college graduates or people who just finished their work and puts them in a classroom for a couple of years wow. to let them try to give students the benefit of all the experience they've mm -hmm. had. And so it's a very good program that helps NASA mm -hmm. to reach kids that we might not otherwise reach. Wow. And, and I know an, another question is probably very, very, a lot of people are asking, um, uh, 
and, and, and as a final question is, are we going to go back to the moon? Yes. Uh, and it's too long for me to explain, but I, I, <laughs> we, we, the journey to Mars is, is in fact what it, what it says. It's a journey. It, a lot of people get hung up on destinations. Mm -hmm. Our ultimate destination for humans is Mars, mm -hmm. at least for the time being. Now, mm -hmm. my granddaughter said, why are we stopping there? But I said, that's another story. Uh, just let me get to <laughs> Mars first. But, but in order to get to Mars, we've got to perfect our technology. We've got to make sure that we understand everything we need to understand about l astronauts living in, in a hostile environment. So we've been working now more than 15 years slightly off the Earth, at 250 miles on the International Space Station. Astronauts have been living and working there. We're learning a lot about how do you live in those kinds of environments. We're developing technologies. The next 10 years, beginning in about 2018, we're going to be orbiting the moon again. We will have uh, SLS, the heavy lift launch vehicle, mm -hmm. and Orion, the crew module, that will take our astronauts back to the lunar vicinity. Mm -hmm. And our hope is that we'll be able to collaborate with our international partners, mm -hmm. with entrepreneurs and industry, mm -hmm. and begin to put things back down on the surface mm -hmm. of the moon, robotic. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to team with one of our international partners. They'll build a, a lander, a lunar mm -hmm. lander, and we'll be able to have astronauts back on the surface of the moon in the decade of the 20s, while NASA continues its focus of getting people on to Mars in the 2030s. So it's going to take a lot of things working right and a lot of collaboration internationally, but I believe it can be done. And, and we're working really hard to make that happen. Wow. Well, well, I'd like to summarize here very quickly with our audiences is, is you, you have some major challenges. You need to become <laughs> that, that next intellectual capital. You need to figure out those yeah. propulsion systems that you need to have. And, and, and once you get your skill level, don't, don't just be mediocre, be best of the best. Yeah. That's what General, uh, General Bolden and Administrator Bolden. Can I make uh, one more recommendation? Sure. I know you're short on time. To, to understand what he's talking about, go to the NASA website, www.nasa.gov, and then up in the search box put Real Martians, R-E-A-L, Martians. And you will get an opportunity to learn about real live <laughs> NASA people who are doing real live things today, experiments, building hardware uh, that you saw in the movie The Martian, if you saw the movie The Martian. If you didn't, go see it, because it's really good. <laughs> General, right. thanks very uh, much. Administrator Boulder, it's, it's a, indeed uh, a, a pleasure. Thank pleasure you, to be with you for being, making this all possible for our, our world to be able to, to, to benefit from this. Thank you, and thank, thanks for doing what you do. Thank you very much. Brig General USAF RET Leon Johnson retired from the U.S. Air Force after 33 years of service. During his Air Force career, General Johnson was the Vice Commander of the 10th Air Force at the Joint Reserve Base in Fort Worth, Texas, served as Mobilization Assistant to the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force and Director of Operations at the Air Education and Training Command a command pilot with over 3,500 hours of military flying time in the T-37 trainer, A-37, and A-10 fighter aircraft included missions over Bosnia in support of Operation Deny Flight. General Johnson also commanded a fighter squadron and a fighter group. Following the events of 9-11, the General Johnson served as a director of the Air Force Crisis Action Team at the Pentagon. He is currently the national president of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporate and board chair for the Tuskegee Airmen Foundation. And we're, we're being joined now with another very, very special guest and a longtime friend of mine. Uh, we have uh, uh, General Leon Johnson, who is, is here, uh, who represents the uh, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporation. Uh, uh, General Johnson, I want to thank you for coming here as one of our subject matter experts. It, there's a lot of our, our young people across the world that never get a chance to hear from a general or anything and, and understand the, the magnitude of your responsibilities. Uh, so I would like you to tell a little bit about you, a little bit about your history, and, and, and how you uh, ended up being the uh, president of the Tuskegee Airmen Corp Incorporation. Well, really, Willie, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a product of my environment. I will mm -hmm. start it that way. My father was in the Air Force. Um, people mm -hmm. said, did you ever think about doing anything else? And I went, not really. I uh -huh. went into the family business. Mm -hmm. uh, between my father and I, we served for 61 years, and we only had about four years of overlap. Mm -hmm. So it was a family business. Um, 
my mission when I went to college was I was going to go to college and become an Air Force lawyer. Mm -hmm. I got to college uh, during the Vietnam War and they okay. determined that the Air Force needed pilots, not lawyers, and I was going to pilot training. Mm -hmm. So I went to Air Force pilot training, came mm -hmm. out of pilot training and spent some years as an instructor pilot. Um, I moved on, did some administrative stuff, uh, went into the Air Force Reserves, into uh, uh, fighters, uh, flew A-37s and A-10s there. And um, along the way, I met a gentleman named Charles McGee. Mm -hmm. I flew A-10s with his son. Um, Charles McGee is one of the documented original Tuskegee Airmen. Um, he has the distinction of flying over 400 mm -hmm. combat missions wow. in three wars wow. and is still around to tell us about it. And I met him and he introduced me mm -hmm. to the organization. This was back in the early 80s. I've been around it a while. I moved on to do some other things. I was uh, in the Pentagon and the organization Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated has two vice presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, the first vice president handles the organizational stuff. The second vice president is the one who deals with be interface between the organization and the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. And I had the honor of holding that position for seven years. Wow. Um, and one night at a convention, uh, a couple of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, took me aside and put their arm around me and said, you know, we think going forward at some point you ought to be the guy who, tr who runs our organization. Mm -hmm. And um, as I came out of my working for a living, mm -hmm. I took on this working for a living and not getting paid for mm -hmm. it, and uh, it's a labor of love. Mm -hmm. um, I think you heard from Marv Abrams earlier that you know this organization is about preserving the heritage and legacy of the documented original Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. and working with youth uh, with the emphasis on education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, mm -hmm. and what they can do to move themselves forward. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time out talking to young people, and you know, you want to communicate with them and leave mm -hmm. them with something that's easy to remember but has impact. And my point for young people, for all of you folks out there, is three words. Progress demands sacrifice. Don't care what you're doing in life. Don't care what activity you're trying to accomplish. You don't get there without making some sacrifices. And the example I use is, you know, you're out with young people and they're at an event and they don't have the ability to drive. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Somebody made a sacrifice to get you there. Your progress, being at the event, came at the sacrifice of somebody else. When you get into the real world of it, it says on uh, Friday night, you go hang out with your buddies or get that homework assignment mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. You get the homework assignment started. Go, go do the work. Go yeah. do the homework. That's right? right. Because if you want to progress in life, nothing is free, nothing is easy. Mm -hmm. You have to have sacrifice. You mm -hmm. have to have sacrifice. So PDS, three words. It makes a difference in mm -hmm. everything you do in your life. Well, well, when you and I first met, and uh, it's, it's coming up on uh, almost 30 years now that, that when we first uh, encountered, you were with uh, one of the uh, major airlines and I was with one of the, uh, your competitors, but, but in, the, in the aviation industry, it's all a small community, whether you're one airline or another, because we all work together, getting people from point A to B safely. And, and, and in your com capacity, uh, you had an opportunity to be a, one of the hiring managers at that time and and understanding what the shortages then are and what the shortages that we we're facing could you could you possibly elaborate on some of the the, the problems that we're going to be facing here in the near future and and also the opportunities that are available for our youth um, there's tremendous opportunity in the airline industry um, the airline industry especially on the in all aspects it's a sine wave and if you don't know what a sine wave is, folks, go check it out. I but like it's a that. sine wave. <laughs> and what the sine wave means is there are peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a huge peak back in the 70s, mm -hmm. in the late 70s. A lot of military pilots came out and went to the airlines. Mm -hmm. Well, the airlines used to have a retirement age of 60. They moved it up recently to 65. But guess what? That big hiring slug of pilots is going out the door fast. They're going out the door faster than the airlines can meet the need right now. So there is a tremendous opportunity, but just to say I want to be a pilot, mm -hmm. um, 
aviation is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a lot of background. It takes the basics. Let's go back to progress, demand, sacrifice. Go back to what General Bolden was talking about, about the importance of science and mathematics. Mm -hmm. It's the basis of aviation and aerodynamics. So you got to have the basics before you can go forward to the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So what we would always look for when we're out there hiring pilots, whether you're looking for a military pilot, I've sat on military pilot selection boards, I've sat on, I've run airline hiring mm -hmm. for uh, two major airlines. What we're always looking for is we're looking for good employees. Whether you're talking mm -hmm. about a good employee that wears the uniform, mm -hmm. or whether, uh, the military, or someone that wears your airline mm -hmm. uniform. The most important part is a good employee. You assume that at the point at which someone's trying mm -hmm. to get an airline job, mm -hmm. they have the basics, they know how to mm -hmm. fly. Mm -hmm. When you're looking for somebody to be in the military, uh, the military, you can go in with zero flying time and come out the back end as a pilot a year later. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for someone that has the right basics. Mm -hmm. Because given the basics, you can build upon the basics and take someone to where they want to be, but you have to be mm -hmm. willing to make the sacrifices along the way. Wow, wow, that's fantastic. Now, it looks like we, we have some uh, questions coming in from our audience. Uh, uh, would you mind answering sure. my question? Um, the first question is, are there any challenges you have faced in your career? There are always challenges. Life mm -hmm. is a challenge, <laughs> but when you talk about aviation, the challenges mm -hmm. are um, a whole lot more um, dangerous mm -hmm. because the consequences, you cannot pull over and park your car, or put, park your airplane like you can park your car. Mm -hmm. um, so the big thing about the challenges that you face is the preparation. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest challenges that I've seen out there, you know, as, um, as a commander in the military. Um, I was over during Operation Deny Flight over in Bosnia. And the challenge there as the commander was, did I do my job? Mm -hmm. Now I'm building a flying schedule and sending people up on armed combat missions. Have I done my job and prepared them? Mm -hmm. The challenge is, have you done the preparation, mm -hmm. the progress, demand, sacrifice, preparation to make yourself ready? Uh, personal challenges, I've had a couple of airplane problems that mm -hmm. uh, resulted in successful recoveries of the airplane. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ultimate is Sully Sullenberger. Mm -hmm. Preparation, you know, he had 30 to five years of mm -hmm. his career that prepared him for three and a half minutes. Wow. That was all he had from hitting the geese to hitting the water, three mm -hmm. and a half minutes. If he wasn't prepared, if he mm -hmm. wasn't ready, he couldn't have faced the challenge. And that's what I say to everybody. Mm -hmm. Everything you do, in aviation especially, mm -hmm. as a new pilot, you start out with, as I was told when I was in my pilot training class, you have two bags when you mm -hmm. start out. You have a bag of experience, which is empty, and you have a bag of luck, which mm -hmm. is full. Mm -hmm. Every time you climb in the airplane, you steal a little luck, mm -hmm. and it becomes experience. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the back end of your aviation career, you're run out of luck, mm -hmm. but you got a whole lot of experience, <laughs> and that's what mm -hmm. all that uh, mm -hmm. preparation is for. That's yeah. how you fa face those challenges. Yeah, so one of the, the first things that I learned over 40 uh, uh, plus years ago when I first became a pilot is the number one thing that we look at is safety safety first and that that goes to exactly w everything you just stated um, because ultimately you want to get in an airplane you want to travel from point A to B and back and come back home safely and that's the first thing that we talk so preparation getting that to that level skill level and never, ever, ever stop preparing yourselves for whatever it is you're going to take. Those are the things that, that our students need to learn now. If they get that early yes. uh, and they carry that throughout their lives and throughout their careers, they're going to be, be prepared for the challenges. The challenges of life. Life mm -hmm. is a challenge. And, and I, I would like you to conclude um, with, with some final thoughts for uh, our our folks out there, our young people, and our educators, and, and all of our audience that's listening from around the world, uh, your final thoughts on that? My final thoughts start with all you young people out there, somebody in that room, an educator, a support person, turn around and tell them thank you. Because basically what they're doing is they're handing you the keys to the kingdom. Is as General Bolton said, we are not going to get 
you to Mars, you are going to get us to Mars. Mm -hmm. And so the future is in your hands. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of opportunities like this and lead us into the next century. Well, General Johnson, thank you very much for being here and uh, being an uh, inspiration, being one of our subject matter experts for, for the youth of our world and helping them to see, you know, what the the challenges will be and opportunities that, that lie before them. So it was thank my, you very it's much. It's my pleasure being here and I need to do one little advertisement. Okay. Uh, for those of you who want to know about who the Tuskegee Airmen are and what they did, please go to our website, www.tuskegeeairmen.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. My pleasure. Upon graduation from the United States Air Force Academy, Drew entered the United States Air Force as a second lieutenant in May of 1984. He completed undergraduate with helicopter pilot training at Fort Rucker, all earning a helicopter qualification and his pilot wings in March of 1985. His initial assignment was a combat rescue helicopter pilot from 1985 to 1987. He transitioned into the United States Air Force Special Ops and flew over 60 combat missions and operations from Panama to the Persian Gulf, northern Iraq. He returned to flight training to receive a rating in a jet aircraft in 1983. He became a test pilot in the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School in 1994. He worked as a project test pilot and commanded two flights test organizations and served in the United States Air Force Combat Man Staff. As a command pilot with 25 years of experience, Colonel Drew retired in 2010. Alvin Drew, a former NASA astronaut, is now with us as our final guest to wrap up our, our huge celebration honoring America's heroes. Thank you, uh, Colonel Drew, for being here. Uh, this is a unique opportunity, and I, and I couldn't think of a better person to, to come in and, and close out our, our session with our audience. We, we, we have an audience going from uh, the Canary Islands all across the United States, all the way out to uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Wow. And, and, and thank you uh, for someone that has, has flown, is it, is it two missions two that you've flown mm -hmm. in space? Yes. And, and, and you go around and you're orbiting the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour and you're looking down. I understand from your perspective, mm -hmm. you don't see any borders. No, not a one. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about you and, and about your experiences and, and everything? So I think the journey to space began when I was oh, about four and a half, mm -hmm. um, oddly enough, looking at airliners. Uh, my father was out flying out of Baltimore, Washington International, mm -hmm. and we went out. Back then we had observation decks. And I looked out over the rail and watched these, uh, these jetliners backing up and going down the runway. And they went out and went thunder down this runway, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. Then popped a wheelie and then did the craziest thing I'd ever seen. The back wheels came off the ground and it flew away. Mm -hmm. And I walked back in and I thought, what was that? And they said, no, that's, 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 mm -hmm. that's those airliners. I, wow. I said, I need to do that. Uh, and, uh, I call my grandmother and my mother social arsonist. They threw gasoline on that fire once they saw me um, you know, burning about something like that. And they, they bought me airplanes and, and, and manuals and coloring books and things like that. And about a year and a half mm -hmm. later, I was in, uh, in school, first grade, you know, watching the Apollo 7 launch. And mm -hmm. the same thing, this rocket comes off the pad and goes up and goes, disappears up into the sky. Wow. And I talked to my yes. principal about this. And, oh, what was this? These guys are on a campaign to go to the moon. And even if I think it's five and a half, I knew that was crazy. And as I told us, you can't do that. The moon's all the way up in the sky. You just can't get there. And I said, you watch them. I think they'll make it one of these days. And uh, the next summer they were there, they were on the moon. And I talked to my dad. And I said, well, I've got, a, I've got this quandary I'm in. And I said, mm -hmm. I want to be a pilot, but I also want to be an astronaut. <laughs> and he goes, you can do both of those things. So wow. I says, but you got to study. You know, you got to uh, stay out of trouble. And you shouldn't talk back to your parents. And I said, well, how about mm -hmm. two out of three? And we can, mm -hmm. we, we can work with it. But then I was on, on my way. I had, a, I had a sense of purpose, and I never really looked back after that. Wow. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, I know I'm, I'm looking, and we have a lot of our, our guests out there 
that uh, are interested in calling in and asking questions and, mm -hmm. and, and they could do so um, by going to our uh, webcast is uh, www .our, or correction www.shadesofbluewebcast at gmail.com okay. and, and if they have questions while you're here uh, we'll, we'll answer some of those questions okay. and and you you mentioned the the your father mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's that's very very crucial um, in anything in life was was taking place here in order to to succeed having a parent there to support that individual or having not only one parent but both parents yes How feel extremely fortunate, you know, especially you know, this, this, both my parents were, they were a tag team, you know, you couldn't play one against the other, they, you dealt with both of them. Uh, they were both mm -hmm. determined that all four of us children were going to have opportunities in life, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't tell us what we should go do, but um, they felt that we should have the basics, no matter whether you're going to go be a doctor, you're going to be a, a ball player, you're going to mm -hmm. go be a, you know, an astronaut, or whatever mm -hmm. crazy thing you would do, um, all those things required the same set of fundamental basics, you know, mm -hmm. all the reading, writing, arithmetic, and all those other fine mm -hmm. things, and we had to go get those, and anything you wanted to go pursue on your own mm -hmm. after that was fine with them. Uh, but the second part of that was that, you know, times when you just needed some, you know, some guidance or just a mm -hmm. calming voice, and you go, what, what am I taking on here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got this, you can take this on. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was good to have that. The other part of that, I thought, was um, school teachers were mm -hmm. another, because I spent, you know, a third of my day in school with teachers who were mm -hmm. doing the same thing. And the last third of that whole thing was my neighbors. You know, mm -hmm. your neighbors have as much of an influence all you sometimes as your parents do. Because I'm out, I was out wandering around, you know, you know make, being a nuisance to mm -hmm. those people, and uh, <laughs> and they had lots of good advice for me too. Wow, that, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, it looks like uh, we have a question coming in. Okay. When you come back to Earth from being weightless, do you feel really heavy? So this, even before you get back to Earth, okay, so we, on my missions, we spent two weeks in space on each one, and on the way back, in that amount of time, you, you really lose your sense of gravity. Uh, I remember about, it's about an hour to get back to the ground, and about, after about 20 minutes of this, I said, well, we must be getting close to the ground. We must be back almost to a full G, because I feel very, very heavy, and mm -hmm. I didn't have, I couldn't see a, any gravity meter from my, where I was sitting, so I was calling to the pilots, like, what, mm -hmm. what are we up to? And he said, you're up to one-tenth of Earth's gravity right now. Wow. I said, this is going to be a long ride back home. Um, mm -hmm. You know, about a few minutes later, I said, boy, I feel like I can't even get out of my seat like my bones are made out of lead. Mm -hmm. I said, what if it's up to one-third of Earth's gravity? Mm -hmm. And finally, I'm on the ground, and I just feel like that, that somebody has just glued me to my seat. I, said, I, wow. I, will, I will not get out of the seat. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this seat. And one of my crewmates hops out like a gazelle and goes bounding past me. And it was just this <laughs> sheer pride got me out of that chair. But it, it took about two or three days to get back mm -hmm. to um, you know, the getting used to the gravity was, mm -hmm. and you stop feeling happy, happy after about an hour, but your balance is gone. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it was, you know, just you know, grab something to hold me steady and turn slowly before mm -hmm. so I don't tumble. So it takes a while to get back to uh, mm -hmm. dealing with gravity again. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's my understanding that um, when, when you're launching the space and, you, and you're orbiting around the Earth and you're moving around the Earth at uh, about uh, 17,500 miles an hour, and if you can imagine uh, taking a, a ball and attaching a string to it and spinning it around, and that's that, that uh, spacecraft orbiting around the Earth. Yes. And as you're orbiting around the Earth, you're moving at that velocity, but yet you're weightless. Yes. And, or n you're not really weightless, but you're in a microgravity. Mm -hmm. But and the spacecraft is falling. The spacecraft is falling, away, and you're falling with it. And you're falling inside of the spacecraft. Yes. What's what's that sensation like? It's a. Uh, you think it'd be like a roller coaster where you go over the top and you get mm -hmm. that light sensation in your stomach, mm -hmm. and it's not like that. It's much more like scuba diving or, mm -hmm. or floating in a pool, except you're just not wet. You just mm -hmm. you're floating in the air, and mm -hmm. and. and and it really brings out the five-year-old in you mm -hmm. after a while because you realize that, you know, to go across the room, you don't walk across the floor. You can jump off the floor, bounce off the ceiling, <laughs> bounce off your crewmate's head, and then stick to landing. And, and they'll do the same to you in a few minutes, too. But that's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very liberating, yes. Well, what, what was the, the, the most significant thing? And, and, and tell us about uh, a, a little bit about your role while you were uh, up on orbit as an astronaut. Okay, so both my missions were effectively this exact same thing. We were building a space station. When I showed up there as an astronaut in 2000, we had just started that project to build a space station. And when we wrapped up the space shuttle program, we had just finished it. And so both those missions were to build a space station. And my job was either outfit it, which, which was my job on the first mission, or to mm -hmm. go do the construction part, which is what I did on my second mission. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's absolutely uh, fantastic. And, um, and so 
Uh, you, you said you did two missions? Two missions. Mm -hmm. And, and um, would, you, would you be one of those astronauts to um, uh, consider a trip to Mars? Only with a round trip ticket. A round uh, trip I ticket. Spent, <laughs> I spent two weeks in space looking around at the different planets, and I figured out quickly that my favorite planet in the solar system was Earth. Earth. Uh, they got the best <laughs> coffee, the best pizza, and all my friends did that. So uh, I, I definitely would like to come back to Earth someday. Yes. So, so in other words, this is, this is our oasis. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. So we go out and visit those other planets, but at some point, I want to come back home. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that yeah. idea. Yes. Um, uh, looks like we have another question that is coming in to us. Uh, what is it you like doing? Uh, uh, what is it like doing a spacewalk? Spacewalk is an incredible experience. If you ever get a chance to go out and do that, because you know, in, in all these different spacecraft, you're looking out through a, a small window. They don't spend a lot of money on glass on spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And so you press your nose up and you can see a little bit of the universe around mm -hmm. you. When you're in a spacewalk, you've got this visor and mm -hmm. just the whole universe is wrapped around you. I really felt like a sense that I was out in the universe when I was doing a spacewalk. Uh, I remember the first 30 seconds of my first spacewalk, I had to go out there because you got a lot of work to do. And then it's like, I'm not going to go out there to sightsee and mm -hmm. take a bunch of pictures and selfies. I have work <laughs> to do. Um, and so I'm going to get out here. I'm going to you know, figure out my path out the door because the, the first few seconds getting out and not getting tangled up in your, in your tethers is, 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 takes some mental effort. Pretty challenging. So I'm going to focus. I'm going to concentrate. I get out and we're right over top of the Amazon rainforest. It's a clear day. I can see clean down at it from the Amazon. Mm -hmm. I can see the Andes Mountains in the west. I can see the Atlantic Ocean in the east and all the muddy water going to the Atlantic. And it just would not be ignored. You know, mm -hmm. just, I said, okay, and my crewmates said, just stop and take it in. You've know, you got, you got plenty of time, so mm -hmm. just take the next 30 seconds and, and absorb that, mm -hmm. and then we'll get on with the job once that's done. Wow, so, so with the spacecraft moving at 17,000 miles an hour, and you're mm -hmm. tethered out there, mm -hmm. and, and being tethered, separated from the spacecraft, you're in essence an uh, independent satellite. You are. Your, your spacecraft, that space suit, don't the name for you, it is its own independent spacecraft. It's got mm -hmm. radios, it's got air conditioning, it's got lights, it's got electricity, it's got life support systems. It is a, a, a spacecraft that is simply shaped like a suit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you get the sense that you're out there just flying your own spacecraft in space you know, mm -hmm. all by yourself, yes. Wow, wow, that's, that's uh, fantastic. Do, do we have other questions coming in? Well, 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 we'll, we'll continue. Um, and. Um, what do you, you envision the future to be like in space? Future in space is a couple of different paths, and we're go going down both those paths at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. One is uh, NASA has always been ex an exploring agency. We do mm -hmm. exploration and research, and Earth orbit is a place we've been ex we have explored. And mm -hmm. so it's time for commercial ventures and other people to go out there and private opportunities to go out there and, and you know, they've, that, that frontier has been mm -hmm. settled go up there and NASA has places to go from there. So you'll see commercial organizations, you see them out there right now, already planning to go up there to put space stations and spacecraft mm -hmm. and, and researchers and tourists up in Earth orbit. Uh, NASA has the whole rest of the solar system, the whole other rest mm -hmm. of the universe to get out there and explore. You can see all of our robotic spacecraft out there um, looking at places like Mars and Venus and Mercury and the moons of Saturn mm -hmm. and Jupiter out there. And what I've seen is there's a common theme in NASA mm -hmm. um, where you see the, the unmanned, the robotic mm -hmm. spacecraft there's, there's going to be people running in somewhere behind it. You know, they're usually out there for a reason. So what I expect is that we're going to go try to go to Mars. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll go we'll stop by the moon or something on the way out there. But we're going to go push further out in the mm -hmm. solar system, leave Earth orbit to the, 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 the local ventures out there, mm -hmm. and then we'll, um, we'll go out there. So the folks who are watching now, um, they should have their eye, m mind on places like Mars mm -hmm. uh, and, and places beyond that. And those who are out there doing the science and the big planning next missions may be thinking about things like the moons of Jupiter or the mm -hmm. moons of Saturn. Wow. Uh, it, looks, it looks like we have another question coming okay. in. Is the food good on the ISS? Surprisingly, yes, it's very good. <laughs> I, I, had, I, didn't, I had, didn't have great aspirations for, uh, for a good meal in space. I just happy to be in space. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've been working on it since the days of, of the Apollo astronauts when you mm -hmm. ate food out of a toothpaste tube and, mm -hmm. and just mixed up some tang. Uh, when I was up there, we had international partners. So there was Italian food on board the space station. Wow. There was Japanese cuisine mm -hmm. on board the space station. <laughs> there was good American food. There was barbecue up there and steak and things like that when I was there. And I just a little steak out of a tinfoil packet didn't sound very appetizing, but just out of curiosity, I tried it. Mm -hmm. And it was a good medium steak. It was mm -hmm. good. The barbecue was good. Um, shrimp cocktail, which to me looked, was all dehydrated, it looked disgusting. You rehydrate mm -hmm. it and you pull it out of the bag and it tastes like fresh mm -hmm. shrimp that you just pulled out of the bay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the food was very well done. They've done a lot of research and spent a lot of effort making sure that we have good food for our missions out there. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I expect that'll, keep, that'll continue. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well you, one last question, and, mm -hmm. and, and you, you mentioned the word dehydrated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for a student that doesn't know that, what, what does that mean? Okay, so honest, we don't have refrigeration on board the space station. I'm not sure why we don't. We do have freezers up there for our laboratory equipment, but, um, but none for just to put food in the fridge. And this goes back to the days of Apollo when we just couldn't take refrigerators with us. And so the food will otherwise spoil. And one way you can keep the food from spoiling is to take all the water. You can freeze dry it. You put it in a vacuum, it's supposed to vacuum, the, all the moisture comes out, mm -hmm. it shrivels up, um, and then you can put it in plastic wrap and it keeps for a very long time. And when you're ready to eat it again, you put the water back in and it, it reabsorbs all that moisture and it's as good as new. Not everything does that well, but they've mm -hmm. experimented enough that they know which foods will respond to that well and which mm -hmm. ones don't. Mm -hmm. well, well, Colonel Drew, thank you very much for that. Um, these are a couple of closing remarks. We would like to thank our audience out there uh, from around the world for joining us in this uh, three-day adventure. Uh, we hope that you were able to, to take away some unique insights from all of these subject matter experts because these are, these are the real people, the real experts. The, um, I, I call them the real heroes. Our event will culminate this evening with Shades of Blue honoring America's heroes. Um, those people, not just at the tip of the spear, but the ones that are the unsung heroes that never get recognized. That's our purpose is to recognize because we want you to know that in the aviation field, there's, there's um, thousands and thousands, or actually millions of jobs that are available, not just being a pilot, not just being a mechanic but millions of jobs. There's millions of jobs in the aviation and the space industry right now, but you cannot do those jobs unless you prepare yourselves fully. And, and so my organization at Shades of Blue, uh, we, we thank NASA uh, for, for allowing us to be here to participate um, and, and be able to show the world what we have to offer them, to help them. Uh, our website is www.ourshadesofblue.org. And Colonel Drew, I can't thank you enough and, and everybody, all the subject matter experts for being here and, and giving insight to our, our world to make it a better world. Well, it's been a pleasure to be part of it, Willie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Appreciate it.